Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Hey, welcome to another video. Uh, this is part two of the shock rebuild uh, for the Olin shock that we picked up. Uh, first part, you'll probably appreciate, was a bit of a laugh, uh, a bit of a, a quick and dirty, get it into pieces as, quick, as quickly as possible. Uh, and not spare anything that, that we're going to throw away. Um, this is the finished shock, fully rebuilt. Uh, we were lucky enough to get it down to BG Motorsport in Silverstone. Uh, ben, one of the directors there, was uh, happy to let us film and Ben did the work on the shock himself. Um, and I must say, he is a cracking job uh, rebuilding it, which you'll see in the video. So uh, if you need any work like this done, please check them out. I'll put the link down below. Um, and hope you enjoy the video. In the meantime, if you're not a subscriber at the moment, if you'd uh, do us a favour and subscribe, that would really help us out. And uh, like the video, or not like the video, uh, anything is good, and please comment down below. Uh, thanks for your support. Cheers. Actually, this, this scraper looks done, look, you see? Looks like the way it's split. Yeah, it's all perished. So we'll, um, we'll change that over. So we've got a fresh, fresh entry, fresh backup, and then a fresh little scraper. Manipulate the X-ring in underneath, which is a little bit of a bit So that's that in there. We just need to press that into it. Ready to walk. So, next thing will be um, the shaft. Um, we have a look, it doesn't look to have any pits or anything too nasty on it, but you can see. Like there's a bit of burnishing and wear, okay. you know, where the where it's like where it flutters at ride height, you know. Right. So, okay. um, you generally just put it on the lathe, and we've got some really fine abrasive polishing blocks. So we just run up and down it um, okay. over that, and just sort of give it a bit of a buff and a and a <coughs> polish up. So we've got like two different um, two different stages of that. Like the blue is quite a coarse one, and then you've got um, you know, much finer ones. So you just sort of go. The, um, we greased the seals, so we just put um, a bit of oil on the shelf. And you got an internal space. So is now everything going to go on that shaft now? Yeah. All those bits on that yeah, over there? Yeah, well almost, this compression most, adjuster, but yeah, 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 yeah we'll start loading the stuff back on the back on the shaft now. So we've got, <coughs> um, so we've got a piston rod guys and then we've got um, uh, you know, three mil droop spacer. Yeah. In there. So put it in a set of soft drawers. There's things like that, the little, the, all the little tools, the little. Yeah. Everything like that to so actually do the job properly. Yeah, there's lots of little sort of specialist stuff. Um, you can see, like, the toolbox, you know, like the sort of random. <laughs> like you know, sort of knowing the peg spanners, and um, then you got like um, you know a complete sleeve holder system. So like, yeah. all of these sleeves are different sizes. All for different ones. And then you can either use it. We use them in either. Um, so you can you can um, grip them. So you can uh, do up and undo with with that. So any <laughs> diameter. And then um, obviously we've got the holders as well. So you can then grip any diameter and turn any diameter yeah. 
so you know, yeah. things don't have to be hexagon to yeah. screw and unscrew. Yeah, of course, them. yeah. <coughs> um, so, because of the age of shock, I'll probably change more O rings than I normally would, like, right. um, you know. Yeah, well, it was in a pretty sorry state. Um, yeah. Anyway, wasn't it? So it's been in there a long time, isn't it? So um, you just change this little fella needle, and we've got like two different greases that I always use as well. Like, um, there's a red one which is like get general sort of seals and stuff, and then there's a white one for um, like working seals and stuff that have uh, been fluid, you know, like a low yeah. friction one. So that's the um, rebound jet that's going in there, or rebound needle, sorry. And then that's the jet. So as you as you adjust your rebound like with this adjuster, yep. it, as you wind that wheel, it pushes that pin up and down a okay. slot, which then moves your adjuster rod. Up and down, which then operates a little needle <laughs> against that jet, you know. So the flip, basically, it's just metering how much fluid just is going down sandwich, yeah. and out there, rather than going th being forced through the piston. You know? Right. <coughs> and is that still the same principle we're using shocks now, or is um, it just similar? Yeah, the TTX stuff is different than this now. Um, TTX, most of it is um, solid piston, so. Um, the main piston isn't shimmed, okay. and rather than feeding, like rather than moving the piston through the oil, yeah. it, it, it circulates the oil around the body of the damper right. and through the adjusters that way. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, it's slightly, well, it's a much more efficient um, hydraulic path and way of controlling it. Really. Yeah. Better hydraulic control, just, like um, they can use just less gas work. pressure. Right, okay. Lose gas pre uh, less gas pressure in a shock, so it's more sensitive. Um, so um, you don't get that sort of nose pressure that you have to overcome, you know, with the, yeah. having a lot of gas in a shock. Um, and the adjusters are much more powerful. Um, this, these are um, sort of 85% of your damping really sort of comes from your okay. rebound and your compression is only a fine tuning adjuster yeah. on single tube shocks whereas um, on TTX stuff it's 50-50 right. both adjusters yeah. are you know as effective as each other really. now we're just going to run through these shims um, just check them to, to card build up the shim pack And has each shop got a unique set of shims and, and all the rest of the actually on a particular order and yeah yeah they're um unique uh, you know they're bike unique it's yeah. not a universal thing or anything um valve to spec so you have like a you know a unique shim valve for each bike and then um, you just basically going through and just checking all the parts uh, as they should be, making sure that no shims are um, overly worn or uh, yeah. dished. So here you've got like, um, we're building up like a pyramid, pyramid stack, you see like starting small and going bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it'll come up to, um, this is a preloaded pack, so now I'm putting a centre shim on, which is a thin, thinner shim. And then a slightly thicker, like ring shim, around the outside. Around the outside. Um, so what that means is when you clamp it up, I'm going to put this cover back on. So anyway, yeah, we'll put another, put a new cover on, because this is the shim that seals the fluid against the piston. So um, going back to this, then, so the the inner shim is thin. Yeah. The ring shim is thicker. So slightly higher. So, yeah, yeah. So when you put that on and clamp it all up, it actually dishes the shims. Right. Um, and what that means is it gives you like a preload force, so it has to build a certain pressure before it actually pops, yeah. pops the shims open because <laughs> you're like dishing them on there, you know. So you've got your compression face underneath because obviously as this moves into the shop, the oil's forced down through those pistons yeah. and has to bend those shims right, to okay. go out the other side, yeah. you know. And now I'm going to put on uh, the rebound side. So again, I'll change the one next to the piston. So 
That's the hardest time, Ray. the adjuster rod in which is um it's uh, like a different type of alloy material right. and steel shaft so um it's done as an anti-fade device so as the shot gets hot um this swells at a greater rate this grows at a greater rate than right. this under temperature um so it actually closes the valve to then okay. compensate for the thinning sure. of the fluid Right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's got like an anti fade device built into it. <coughs> and then um, we'll change the bump rubber because this is how they should be, but a certain amount of like give and springiness to it. Bit, a bit squashy in, but, um, in my language. <laughs> the, well, this one, look. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's like, um, you know, because they're so old. Certain perished over the years. Yeah. And then um, with this, we'll um, we just drop a bit of grease in it. Um, well, we've got it off and apart, just make it operate nicely. And then a little bit of log type, and get this assembly back up. Okay, and then that's so the main shaft assembly, yeah. ready to work. Look at this, this is what we brought you. Yeah? Yes, this is um, the piggyback bridge in the reservoir. Um, Both have seen better days, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, but nasty, nasty. So. So it's not quite going to be triggers broom, but uh, no. almost. So fire, fire those. <laughs> So compared to, a, say, the I think the standard is it a shower sh shock on a nine one six is standard. Mm -hmm. So what what the the major well, not all the difference, what the major difference is you you sort of paying for when you want an Olin shot? Um, valve technology really. Is it just, what valve technology? Is it what you were explaining a minute ago? Yeah, about the like little, tr li little trick things like that anti fade device yeah. and the way their pistons are designed mm -hmm. and um, how they cope with um, internal pressure like pr pressure um, balancing. Um, yeah. All of those things are pretty that's unique what, to yeah. Odin's, that's, you know, and, and quality of components. Right, right, okay. You know, like, um, Odin stuff is really nice, but when you, when you strip it out, like, and you put it against um, an OEM shot, you can see where the money, <laughs> yeah. you know, the money is. Um, so then we'll just, um, <coughs> there's a run. Some grease in the shaft assembly, fresh rears. Hopefully, we've got a silk clip somewhere for it. Reason why I put that in there first is so that you don't, because uh, we're going to use this to screw it in. Obviously, okay. you don't want to um, be squashing an open cylinder, so you want to have a cap in so that it so holds keep the it, yeah, keep it open. Yeah, holds the cylinder. Shiny bits. Nice. That was very nice. Shiny. That almost looks like a different Fresh. orange. Yeah, well, that's the difference between a new and an old one, I think. Yeah. Wow.
question is these, they don't have to be massively tight, so you don't need to worry about squashing the cylinder. And then we've got a dividing, dividing piston, which sits in here, which divides the fluid from the nitrogen. So we should have a little Teflon band yep. in the room. To the uh, into the drain tank underneath. <laughs> Do you have to set them any particular way when you're rebuilding it? Like um, all the way to soft or? All, all the way, yeah. yeah. When I open all the blades so that um, when you put all the... So everything moves nice and freely? Well, when you put it on the vacuum rig, you want um, all the blades open because obviously you're going to fill um, everything with fluid. Yeah. So you want to be able to flow the fluid all around the shop nicely. So we're uh, ready to fill her up, really. Um, so what we'll do... Turn the vacuum rig on. Should be primed and ready. We need to set the floating piston height so it's got a bit of reservoir like um, to run on because obviously the floating piston shouldn't be decked out one way or another. Right. Um, <coughs> first off, first cycle is a vacuum cycle, so yeah, yeah. pull a vacuum inside the inside the shop there and then yeah. um, when you purge it purge it with oil it like back backfills the fluid right. and fills it void of any any air. So um, we normally do like two cycles on it once to get the fluid in there. You always end up with a bit of like um, I mean it's tiny amounts but you always end up with like a little bit of um, bit of a fizz obviously getting the fluid actually to go in there so yeah. you, you, you fill all the voids on the first cycle and then back it again which then pulls any air bubbles that you've mixed in with the oil yeah. back out the yeah. oil and then, the and, then and then fill it again should, and then you know that it's yeah, no it's like 100 percent oil yeah or as 100 percent as you can be again you know? yeah. um so yeah that sits on there for, for a minute Five seconds like that. So if this shock had never been uh, serviced at all in its life, I mean, it could be what, 20 years old at the very least, surely? Yeah, the, the card says oh, 94, so it gives you a... Oh, so it's off a 94. Gives you, an, gives you an idea, 
Gives is you that, an idea. Is that unique to the actual shop itself, that details when it was put together? That, that spec was, yeah, it's a 1994 spec, so um, right. it would give you a rough rough idea, I mean yeah. it's not always like that. Yeah. yeah, so between 20 and 25 years it could be put it on the bike or... Yeah, exactly. Um, <coughs> so all those seals, as you can see with that scraper, you know, yeah. like, and the bump rubber and all that, all of those were a little bit well, perish yeah. now, yeah, I need to... So if, um, if you if you rode the shot as it was before, and then literally if someone could instantly change it to, to how it's going to be now, would, would a normal person, if you know what I mean, feel the difference yeah, in should, the way it, yeah. way it rode? Yeah, you should be able to feel, um, it should feel plusher, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and obviously the damping performance will will be different, yeah, of different course. as well, because um, gradually, you know what it's like with most things, things just the performance gradually yeah. just winds away. So if you're riding something daily, quite often you don't notice until yeah, geez, you've had it rebuilt. Now, yeah. Then you know because because it, <laughs> it slowly falls away. Then someone gives you something. You know once it's been yeah. serviced back. You change it then. Yeah. yeah, you know, and then you get the performance yeah. of, uh, increase again. You know? If it was a um, road bike, say sort of twenty thousand, or yeah, right, every that, that every, money, every yeah. few years. Right. Yeah, if it's you know whichever comes first. Yeah. I mean, probably your average driver engine, is yeah. every three years. <laughs> <isn't> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that's done second um, vacuum cycle now, so we'll just fill it back up again. The 45 seconds just because you know that's how long it takes to. to well, uh, yeah, it's just, just a guide. Sure. It's just a guideline yeah. just to, make, to make sure, really. Um, Push it from the rubber membrane in the bottom of the gas cap there. And drop the manometer off. And it should be, now it's 14 bar. Double check that you've got your set clip in so you don't <laughs> shoot the gas cap out. <laughs> no, you don't do that. Uh, we're aiming for 14, so you generally drop like um, a bit more than what you want because as you snap the gauges off, you're going to lose about a bar. Yeah. So, um, so it's 15 on a bar. <laughs> Standard setting is normally two thirds out. Right. So um, you wind all the way in until you feel the click stop, and then um, that that first indent is is zero, and then you count from there. So yeah. Okay. Um, that should fit like a yeah, like a proper damper, and it should come <laughs> back to a to a. Um, a stop as well, with, you know, obviously just checking the floating piston yeah, position is correct. Um, so now, on the dyno. <coughs> what's the, what's the dyno used for? What's that going to tell um, you? It uh, pumps a shock at different speeds, so you've got like, um, 
it's really like a set of scales yeah. but measures in positive and negative um, and then you've got a five horsepower electric motor on a scotch crank so is that is that spins obviously it plunges the rod up and down yeah um, so it just pumps the shock at different speeds and measures how much force the shock's transmitting through it you know? um, from that you can then get a characteristic graph um, which obviously has to fall within a certain criteria yeah. for the bike because obviously you know the shocks just aren't linear up their range yeah, of course. you know the faster the sharp input um, the higher the force but um, you see that you know the, the shapes are, are quite different for different applications like yeah. on a motocross bike you'd you'd have probably quite a progressive um, uh, shape characteristic curve so you wouldn't have a lot of low speed so the wheel can get in and out all the ruts you know yeah, yeah. Um, whereas on something like a sports bike you want that low speed resistance for like chassis control yeah but then obviously because it doesn't have to cope with bumps it needs to be quite soft so that you know as you hit ripples and stuff in the circuit it allows the wheel to blow off and not upset the chassis yeah you know so um like i say it's just different, <coughs> different characteristics for different applications really so would you use this to 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 test sort of a, whether a shot was too worn or not working properly or, yeah. or whether it actually needed some yeah. work. And, um, and obviously checking that it's um, you know working as it should you can check and see how much um, if it's um, suffering with hysteresis or something if you've got uh, air trapped in the, in with right. the oil you should be able to see should, it. Oh, on I was the, tell you. Yeah, right, okay. Well it won't. You need to look yeah, at you, the data. Well, <laughs> it, it wouldn't yeah. tell you but you'd know what you're yeah. looking at if you yeah. saw it yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, obviously um, automotive applications which you know we do a lot of yeah. um, uh, you have to balance axles so you have to consistency check right. um, they have to be so matched to each other so yeah. yeah like at set click settings you have to have you know your front dampers doing exactly the same thing and the back dampers doing exactly the yeah. same thing all the way through the velocity curve all right. the way up yeah so, of course yeah um yeah a lot you know the mismatch should be uh, pretty bad i imagine yeah you've got to <laughs> have a predictable chassis yeah. So that'll then it just does a little warm up so it pumps the shock up a bit. Um, if it's an emulsification shock it'll mix the fluid and the um, all, uh, air together. Right. You know? um, then it'll do a static gas test. So it'll test at one position how much gas is pushing back out and then go into a second position, check yeah. it again. Then it'll take that out of the equation because we don't want to look at gas pressure on the forces. Right. We just want to look at damping forces only which are you know velocity dependent because yeah. um, as it's still stood still obviously it's not damping is it so yeah, of course we you know we want to take that gas pressure force out of the equation so we we'll do two gas test positions and then take that out and then it's on to its first cycle now so it will do um a set uh, constant velocity uh test on the speed measure the forces do another one measure the forces <laughs> yeah. okay. it goes right up to half a metre a second, um, so you know, as you can see, you really know, sort of that's really quite a nasty bump sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, that's a nasty yeah. pothole on a Northamptonshire <laughs> road, isn't it? Yeah. I've wished there were a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> up here you've got, uh, so up here you've got uh, positive figures, so this is your compression side yeah and then underneath you've got negative force figures okay. which is obviously rebound um, and then along the bottom of the graph you've got um, shaft speed right so as the like I said as the speed increases obviously so do the forces yeah but but not in a linear fashion so because <coughs> um, it's tarmac but you know something on tarmac you generally want um, low speed resistance for decent chassis control yeah but then it doesn't need to be have the high speed um, resistance because you're on a nice smooth track. Yeah, it should be. Um, so um, yeah, relatively, if it was linear, obviously, and you had the low speed control, it'd just be like that, and it'd be far too hard yeah. at the top end of the scale. Okay. Um, and or if you could match it at the 
top end of the scale, you then wouldn't have the chassis resistance. So yeah. you've got to have this digressive curve. So it, it raises force quickly, which is what you get from those preloaded shims that I said about, you know, yeah. like um, dishing those shims. Yeah, yeah. So that gives you your low speed resistance. And then once the once you've overcome that preload on the shim pack, it then starts to blow off and then give you a nice progressive curve further up so you can see there's a little bit of progression in it um, and then on rebound you've got this um, you know sort of inward kink and then um, it is the preload and then comes off so that's what's controlling the spring and the you know unsprung mass going back towards the um, back towards the tarmac and um, you know vice versa yeah. 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 what we'll do is I'll, I'll just find another 34 20 code We'll just, so just compare it. Just compare it. Yeah. We'll just make sure that's fine. Um, and um, yeah, cool. we'll, we'll stick her up, spring her up, and <laughs> away we go. Yeah, you know, things really left to do. Uh, just have a look at the, the bearings, really. Um, these foam seals are probably, yeah, look as if they're like half hanging out, so we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to just. Um, Try and remove, gently persuade these uh, top hats out and then um, we'll change the seals and then So Dirt mullered. Yeah. <laughs> well there's nothing left is there? No, that's bad. So, that's two fresh looking frame materials. Um, <laughs> but obviously, as we're knocking them out, you can see the burrs on the inside of the. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, what we'll do is I'll just um, go over to the lathe again and we'll just run a reamer so in it the, now. So, right. that you, you know, when it comes to putting a bolt in, you won't be hitting it with a, <laughs> hitting it with a hammer. Fresh foam cells in the end there. And a beautiful fresh spring. <coughs> Just put a gas warning sticker on it. There we have it. Beautiful. That looks absolutely tremendous. I mean, no. Watch a new one. It's also you alluded to earlier, you don't just do bike shops here, you do anything old in. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, apart from mountain bike actually. Um, oh, right, okay. But yeah. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, so we do. Uh, like race car stuff is probably our main That's bag. Sort of main bread and butter sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, um, we do uh, a fair amount of rally stuff. Um, then um, going on to the bike stuff, we do um, flat track is quite a large right. thing that we okay. do, yeah. Um, and then motocross, um, and then sort of road bikes and circuit bikes yeah. after that, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's pretty good. We're quite lucky in how diverse we are, really. Yeah, so, it's like um, you can be working on a, yeah, a free shot one minute and then. <laughs> go on to a flat track bike or a motocross, yeah. you know. So, Keeps you uh, interested. Yeah, 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 lots of different stuff. So if anyone wants to get in touch, we'll basically give you a call, basically. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Obviously yeah. you've got your website, which I'll, I'll put down below and everything. Yep, yep. Uh, and Correct. all the details on there. But uh, absolute cracking job. Okay, well, uh, nice one. Thank you. Nice one, thank you.